again uh, burning topics in neurology based on epilepsy and uh, sleep medicine and we have a chairpersons dr rajesh garg sir dr samshed divedi sir and uh, my friend dr sanjay choudhury so all of us are there and uh, all of all the three people are very well known persons in the uh, in delhi and neurological circle so now i request them to take the charge thank you dr rajesh garg sir you can start sir you can call uh, the first speaker good evening everyone and it's a pleasure to be here in, in virtual meeting as we are running late by half an hour let's uh, st start the session dr uh, this topic is uh, rational polytherapy in drug resistant epilepsy by dr atmaram bansal everyone knows of dr atmaram bansal doesn't need any introduction let's start with the topic and uh, i'll request all the speakers to stick to time maybe a uh, few minutes less so that we can catch up a bit thank you dr atmaram bansal a very good evening without uh, wasting much time thanks organizer uh, for giving me this opportunity and a very good evening to all the chair persons so this particular topic of uh, drug resistant epilepsy and rational core therapy is uh, very relevant with the way the new drugs are coming so what is the rationale in trying those drugs versus uh, older drugs and how much should we try so with this background now that uh, one point is what is drug resistant epilepsy what is refractory epilepsy we don't have any clear guidelines clear definitions but pre previously this rule of 2 was there that if somebody is having more than two seizures in a month for more than two years and has been tried on two drugs then this was clearly a case of drug resistant epilepsy but with changing time some things are changed one is duration and other is frequency only thing constant is two drugs so if somebody has been tried adequately on two tolerated and appropriately chosen drugs so these two points are important the patient has should have tolerated those two drugs and they should have been the drug of choice for those particular type of syndromes or particular type of epilepsy so if both fails then it is clearly a drug resistant epilepsy and what is drug responsiveness that is another important point when can we say that our patient is responding to the medication so there is a timeline as per ile if somebody is having seizure free interval of more than 3 times of the baseline or of 12 months so that means if somebody is getting seizure per month minimum 12 months are required for seizure freedom if somebody is getting seizure only one per year then at least 3 years are required to say that somebody is seizure free or drug responsive so uh, brody martin brody is very famous for this uh, particular topic of newly diagnosed epilepsy and prognosis and drug responses so one of this particular article clearly said about one third are not responsible and out of them another one third are a surgical candidate but to, what to do in those patient who are not responding drug resistant plus not a surgical candidate and this is a very common scenario we face in our epilepsy clinic especially at referral center so why these patient becomes refractory and when when can we say that this patient is refractory when do they become refractory so there are certain studies this particular study was very drastic kind of thing saying that once two drugs fail the third ch chances are only 3 to 5% but while other studies have mentioned that some patient had good response even up to 28% another study mentioned up about 15% patient had seizure remission even for 6 months despite being drug resistant so why this discrepancy in result of uh, martin brody versus other studies martin brody had a very clearly study population of confirmed syndromic diagnosis where their appropriate drugs were used patient were on regular follow up and were using appropriate doses there was a strict criteria so that was a study population while in practice we see the real clinical setting where the syndromic diagnosis might have been wrong drug choice might have been wrong and follow up and doses might have been the another issue so those patient are likely to respond and this is those are the patient where we should think of optimal therapy so drug resistance is also not a very strict or constant phenomenon it's a fluctuating phenomenon one patient may not respond today with one particular drug may start responding when another 
another drug and at the same time one patient responding to the one particular drug may start stopping having response and start having seizures so when there is a drug resistant epilepsy what should we do what are the questions we should discuss what are the points we should know so there are certain c's we should know one is correct diagnosis most importantly is it really epilepsy or not it is a, if it is epilepsy what type of epilepsy what drug are we giving what dose we are giving is really the patient compliant plus is there any covert lesion on mri suppose there is a clear lesion on mri and patient is not responding we should definitely think of surgery comorbidity issues triggers in reflex epilepsy if we can avoid those triggers then is it really a true epilepsy so uh, once case uh, at 18 year old boy with recurrent seizures having nocturnal, nocturnal gtcs mri and eeg absolutely normal so as patient had gtcs patient was started on valproate and then levetiracetam but had no response so nocturnal seizures every week no response to two drugs it actually become drug resistant but when the patient was worked up patient had clearly frontal spikes so being focal epilepsy patient was started on carbamazepine and then clobazam and patient had excellent response so these kind of cases are there which are there in practical scenarios where syndromic diagnosis is different and so patient was not responding and then responded to the appropriate drug similarly another case a 21 year old boy having seizures very uh, frequently with fall and uh, loss of consciousness lasting for 10 minute half an hour somebody did the eeg multiple time and once reported as abnormal and because of that abnormal eeg and loc patient was started on levetiracetam and topiramate and resulted in significant psychosis so when home video was seen it was clearly a case of non epileptic behavior all the eegs were reviewed they were not showing any epilepsy but they were benign variants so it's very very important that when mri is normal and syndromic diagnosis is only possible on eeg the quality of eeg should be good benign variant drowsy eeg many a times is reported as epileptic on discharges so what is this psychological non epileptic event this is a very very important dd in refractory epilepsy and about one third are having refractory epilepsy with only non epileptic event about 10% are having combination so when should we suspect in a patient if somebody is having seizure and now likely non epileptic event if somebody is having recent change in frequency with high frequency no response to anti epileptic drug sudden change in semiology variable semiology longer duration of event so if the events are of a longer duration fluctuating semiology changing semiology then they are more likely to be non epileptic if somebody is having stereotyped semiology and very brief then they are more likely to be epileptic so when should we suspect non epileptic event actually always you should suspect so coming to the point of uh, drug uh, management in these patient so among the drug resistant epilepsy one what is our goal our goal is seizure freedom but at the same time adverse event should not be much therapy should be optimal as per comorbid condition quality of life is equally important and then cost effectivity especially in indian scenario so it's the ideal scenario is no seizures plus no side effect which is practically not possible so either we compromise on seizures or on side effects or on both at times so best is minimal seizures and minimum side effect so quality of life depends not only on seizure control but also on anti epileptic toxicity comorbidity and psychosocial issues so seizure can control is no doubt an optimal uh, very important goal at the same time it is not the only goal which to, needs to be achieved at all cost so what is rational polytherapy when we combine drugs with different mechanism so that we have potential synergistic action avoiding drug which have similar adverse reactions optimal drug uh, dose and broad spectrum ones at times we do use side benefits what are side benefits like uh, zonisamide having weight loss so we can use that benefit over uh, adding the drug which had caused the weight gain so polytherapy is not new it's not uh, something which we are trying it has been tried even in 1912 by phenobarbitone and bromide combination phenytoin and phenytoin combi phenobarbitone combination since 1953 we know very well that uh, this phenytoin phenobarbitone combination is being used by many quacks and many clinics and or and uh, many of those patient having excellent response 
So with newer drugs, so many drugs coming, then this question of which drug should be combined, how it should combine. So these become a bit uh, important topic to discuss. And with so many drugs uh, coming, and it's like very likely that newer drugs will also be launched uh, uh, in the newer uh, next few couple of weeks or months. So what drug needs to be used? So one is disease oriented and other is patient oriented. In disease oriented, which type of epilepsy patient is having? What epilepsy syndrome patient is having? Patient factors are also important like weight, male or female, what job patient is doing, what other comorbidities are there, what is the quality of life. At the same time, we also need to know about the drug, what are the pharmacokinetic property and other issues. So method of transition is suppose uh, somebody is taking two drugs already and patient is not responding. Then we may have to cut down on one drug and start on another drug. So there can be an, there should be an overlap. If you start after stopping it, very likely that during that period, there can be seizure recurrence. So overlap depends what kind of epilepsy it is, what, how bad is the epilepsy and how frequent are the seizures. So clinically, there are many studies. Two, three combinations have been found to be quite effective, well proate with lamotrigine, tinitrine with phenobarbitone, lamotrigine with topiramate, well proate with isosuximide, and carbamazepine with clobazam. What polytherapy we can use at, in terms of diagnosis? If it is idiopathic generalized epilepsy, we know that well proate, lamotrigine, topiramate, levetracetam, phenobarbitone, Donisamide are the drugs. In rational polytherapy, valproate along with lamotrigine or with donisamide or lamotrigine with topiramate. And irrational is if we use levetracetam and topiramate or carbamazepine with phenytoin. In focal epilepsy, carbamazepine with clobazam is good, phenytoin with phenol. Levetracetam with lecosamide is one combination among the newer drugs which can be used. A white sodium channel with sodium channels. In epileptic encephalopathy, it's like LGS. Well, it with any drug combination like lamotrigine, clobazam, with jonisomide, but avoid sodium with sodium channel. So there is a, another study which has been known many about 1,000, 8,000 patients for various combinations, but that includes sodium channel with GABA, with synaptic vesicle, with multiple mechanism. And maximum combination used was sodium channel with synaptic vesicle. That means levetracetam or baravacetam with sodium channel drug. And what was found that patient retained maximally on this combination rather than on GABA with sodium channel or GABA with GABA, which was the least uh, selected uh, combination. So when we are thinking of polytherapy, sodium channel drugs with GABA having synergistic action, sodium with broad spectrum have some efficacy, but if you combine two GABA, then efficacy may improve, but tolerability will be less. If you combine two sodium channel, then definitely tolerability will be less, so not preferable. And certain drugs uh, in terms of side benefits, if weight gain is there, then topiramate and jonisamide are good choice. If there is behavior issues, carbamazepine, valproate, and lamotrigine is good choice. From depression point of view, same combination can be tried. Migraine point of view, valproate and topiramate can be tried. So among the newer drugs, I'm not going into detail, but parampanil had been being used and it has been found to be effective on at least around 10 to 15 percent of the patients, like a wonder drug in some of the cases. Brevetrastam is launching in the next one or two weeks in a very aggressive way by almost all the companies. Rufinamide, ritagib, uh, retigabine, I don't have any personal experience. So when we come to bench to bedside, the first step is we should know the history and patient knows the best or the attendant knows the best take detail, see videos that will help in making a diagnosis, see the past and present anti-epileptic, which drug was effective, which drug had side effect. Then second step is again review the history and third step also go to the previous record. So only way to know whether this particular drug has been tried or not or was effective or not is by taking history. So once we know that this patient is not responding to drug drugs, another important part is whether patient is a surgical candidate or not. Many of those patients are really very good surgical candidate and uh, it's very, uh, those four patients are actually fortunate if they get surgery and they are seizure free and the chances are almost 80-90% in majority of the centers where this workup is done. Then try third drug, if not effective, 
try another drug, another drug. At times, may not be the fifth, sixth, or seventh day drug may be effective. So take home message: it's a patient-oriented pharmacotherapy. There are many new drugs with different mechanisms of actions, with better pharmacokinetic profile, better tolerability. No. So rational polytherapy is mainstay, and seizure freedom can be achieved in about one third of the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atmaram. Uh, we are running a little late, so I maybe know. there are some no questions. I hope uh, I was on time, sir. You are on time. Okay. <laughs> Mamta, maybe you can start. Okay, I hope. He needs no introduction. I hope the chairperson doesn't feel offended. I, I don't mind starting. No, no, chairperson, I, he can chair the next talk. Okay, so then. With your permission, I will start sharing my screen the time. So okay. good evening to everyone. And I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Rachel and the organizers for giving me this opportunity and especially for changing the topic that they had originally suggested to me about which I was quite clueless. And, and I, uh, I'm glad Dr. Bansal gave this talk good segue to my, my presentation. And uh, I will briefly discuss my experience with outreach clinics and try to convince, especially the youngsters, that this may be a good step for uh, more of us to get uh, in, involved in if uh, you know we are serious about reducing the epilepsy treatment gap. So um, most of what I'm going to be presenting today is my experience working on uh, the Lifeline Express, which is a mobile hospital and on which I have been conducting these uh, epilepsy clinics now since more than 10 years. Um, so we just heard a talk on epilepsy. Unfortunately, in most conferences or um, meetings that we have, we talk about epilepsy, but untreated epilepsy or the epilepsy treatment gap is seldom discussed at any length. And we tend to uh, keep it on the fringes or, you know, pretend it's not there. But I think we need to talk a little more about it, discuss and maybe find ways in which we could actually reduce the treatment gap rather than just, you know, all of us have been quoting that the treatment gap is 70 to 90% for the last couple of decades, at least in my lifetime, that's the way it has been. So this is how I see epilepsy in our country. Most of our emphasis remains on these 30% patients who uh, unfortunately have the more difficult kind of epilepsy, which is drug resistant, some of whom may be surgical candidates, few of which may actually get surgery, but the large you know, chunk of patients who, who may do very well on uh, one or two drugs, become seizure free and, and lead pretty normal lives are largely left uh, you know, unattended, uh, uncared for. And um, I see this as a failure in our, uh, our treatment protocols uh, in the conventional clinics, which are largely tertiary care clinics, because neurologists are by and large, you know, practicing in big cities in large tertiary care hospitals. And in these tertiary care clinics too, you see that there are too many patients and of course there are very few doctors. So, uh, so there is this gap in care, um, in, in uh, epilepsy primary care, secondary care, and whoever can scrambles, reaches tertiary care clinics, um, whether they may need it or not. And uh, so the outreach clinic probably may be a good uh, mode of care uh, because this is likely to fill the gap that we have, the enormous gap we have in epilepsy primary care. So till such time that, you know, we have uh, hundreds of more primary care providers, I don't know, that's going to take several decades uh, probably, but it's not happening anytime soon. Uh, till, till that time, the only way to bridge this epilepsy primary care uh, deficit that we have is by having more outreach clinics, which do have a lot of potential. There are problems which I will briefly be touching upon, but then there's a lot that can be accomplished by these clinics. And why do I say, from where, where am I coming when I say that there is a gap in primary care? 
So because I sensed this, I think all of us sense this, that uh, care is pretty dismal, you know, in smaller towns, villages, almost no care. So we looked at patients uh, who were attending one of, uh, at our uh, hospital, we looked at about 400 patients and we tried to classify these patients into those who truly needed tertiary care and those who, who came to us for care, but actually did not, did not really need, were not eligible for tertiary care. To make this distinction, we used, uh, the, there are NICE criteria to do, to do this. And we used a modification of the NICE criteria and divided patients. And then we discovered that uh, as many as 43% of patients who attend our clinics at AIMS do not actually require tertiary care. And uh, most frequently, the reason that they cited for coming to uh, AIMS was an unsatisfactory response to treatment. Although when we delve deeper, we find that as many as about 60% are not actually not responsive to treatment, but they actually were non-adherent to treatment. So if there was good primary care and it took care of non-adherence, if there was you know, counseling patient education, then you can see that at least half or about 40% patients who are, that are visiting any of our centers, I guess, are, uh, are actually not even candidates for tertiary care. And they end up, uh, you know, burdening tertiary care also uh, in the process. So, so primary care is, of course, absent and tertiary care, uh, the quality goes down once you are overburdened with the patients who do not actually need this kind of care. Then uh, in the context of... Uh, outreach clinics. The other serious concern that uh, colleagues have is how can you uh, start treatment, you know, for patients in outreach clinics without investigations. So anyone who has, uh, you know, participated in an in outreach clinic will know that most patients that we see in such clinics are actually have never been investigated. If at all they have been investigated, you know, sometime five, 10 years uh, back, they generally do not provide documents. So by and large, you are left to your clinical skills uh, to make this distinction between uh, focal and generalized epilepsies. And this syndromic distinction, uh, we know that it is important because this is uh, kind of uh, our uh, decision point in, in uh, choosing the drug, the correct drug for the patient that was uh, being spoken about by Dr. Uh, Atmaram recently, I mean, in the last talk. So we, we thought, you know, can this distinction be made without investigations? That was a research question. Dr. Shambhu looked at this and uh, looking at 500 patients, we found that if patients were categorized into focal epilepsy or generalized, uh, either based on history alone or, uh, you know, history along with uh, investigations, there was a difference uh, or a change in the syndromic diagnosis in a very small minority, just about 3% patients, which just goes to emphasize that in primary care, which is what you provide when you do outreach clinics, and you are uh, doing due diligence in taking the history you are very likely to, to, uh, to make a correct uh, diagnosis, whether this is a focal epilepsy or generalized, and therefore pick the right drug. So this fear of you know, making wrong decisions is not really uh, is true. So outreach clinics should not be weighed less just because patients are being seen largely without investigations. That is one concern that people have about outreach clinics. And the second is, that most of these clinics are also a one-time event. So, so you visit a place, you see patients, and you know you may uh, make a diagnosis, start them on treatment, and then you go away. And then there is no systematic uh, way of following up these patients. We cannot at all imagine having an epilepsy clinic without follow-up. That's not the way the clinic has to be done. So mm -hmm. I'm not advocating that, you know, this is what we need to do, but I definitely feel that uh, if the choice is between doing nothing and providing at least, uh, you know, a one-time clinic, I would choose a one-time clinic any day. And this study, uh, Chintan has looked at patients who were seen once on the Lifeline Clinic. And 
we had earlier done a short term uh, you know outcome to see how many of these patients continue on treatment within 6 months of of being started on treatment and we had found a good number i think about 50% or so had continued taking treatment but then we were wondering what happens in the longer term so uh, chintan looked at these patients and this was a 2 to 5 year outcome uh, data from the lifeline express so as i've just told you that in this clinic we see patients once and then we do not have an opportunity to systematically follow them up some of them a few very few of them actually they they do turn up at aims and follow up with us with us over here and and some of them i assume uh, you know go to local doctors but most i think remain uh, without any systematic follow up so we looked at outcomes and compared it with uh, our aims clinic uh, patient outcomes so uh, there were about 1200 patients uh, who were enrolled at aims in the same time duration as the lifeline clinics where about 1800 patients were enrolled this was the biggest problem with the study that we could after all efforts uh, actually follow up only about half the patients at aims so these patients were either uh, continuing to follow up or the ones who had stopped we made telephonic follow ups Uh, and we were eventually able to reach about half of the patients that we had that had been enrolled at aims on the lifeline clinic this number was even fewer because uh, you know this is uh, follow up extending up to 5 years a lot of these were all telephonic follow up so a lot of people had changed their phone numbers so not available anymore uh, some uh, probably numbers were not reachable etc so uh, so a smaller number but then as a as a number this seemed to be pretty uh, decent so we we still were interested in what happened to these patients so as you see in the aims patients and this follow up about 19 patients had died and 40 patients had died in the lifeline clinic this was the most encouraging uh, part of the result so how many patients continued anti seizure drugs we look at aims which is of course all the bells and whistles tertiary uh, tertiary care clinic you see about 87% patients continuing on medicine but then you look at the lifeline continuation rate with just a one time clinic you can uh, ensure almost a 70% continuation of anti seizure drugs which to me was very encouraging considering you know we had no no follow ups for these patients then uh, epilepsy had resolved in a comparable number in both the arms and then there was premature stopping of drugs in uh, 6% of patients at aims and somewhat higher in the lifeline clinic the other uh, interesting thing that i would like to share in in the lifeline clinic if you look at the treatment gap at enrollment here in this study this was defined as patients who had stopped treatment uh, without seizure free for for uh, at least 5 years so it was about 50% at enrollment in the in the reach clinic and at follow up you see this had dropped to improved to you know more than so this is just about 20% so you see so much could be achieved by just a one time clinic which which Doctor, was, how many slides are left you have only one minute okay i'll finish in one minute okay so uh, So so what i'm trying to say is that an outreach clinic even if it's a one time clinic can actually achieve a lot and as far as our concern for follow up is concerned i will just share that you know nurse led clinics uh, also we have demonstrated are as good as neurologist follow up clinics and also uh, a long time back before the pandemic now i think most people are doing tele tele clinics but many years back we had randomized patients into uh, clinic follow up and telephonic follow up and we found that uh, you know the breakthrough seizures are the same in both arms so telephonic follow ups are, are as good as clinic follow ups additionally tele telephonic follow ups save time they save money and fewer patients get lost to follow up so so there's there's a lot of role for outreach clinics and i must just briefly emphasize research so you look at aspects of epilepsy patients that you do not get to see in the clinic we looked at injuries and found that odds of injury of patients presenting to these outreach clinics is about eight times higher uh, compared to patients that we are seeing at aims and adjusted odds are as much as about 16 times higher and this is the last slide if an outreach clinic has got epilepsy educators this probably is the backbone and absolutely essential component so a well run clinic with epilepsy educators 
can really uh, help to narrow treatment gap, especially the primary uh, epilepsy care gap. And my take home message would be that, for, especially for the younger people, the residents, uh, junior faculty, that if you have time, do consider participating in outreach clinics. And with educators, this can be a very effective tool for narrowing uh, the treatment gap. And I must thank my neurology colleagues because you know, with their help, I've been able to do this for, for more than 10 years now. They, they fill in for me when I vanish every month over a weekend. And uh, I, with that, I, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I request uh, my co-panelists to take over. I've been speaking all the time. Sorry, I got disconnected. So, Namaste and a very good evening to all of you. I'm delighted to participate in the annual event of the Delhi Neurological Association. In this uh, virtual fashion, it is uh, quite a privilege to be there without being there. I thank Professor Achal Srivastava for inviting me to present at this meeting. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that we uh, get going with uh, the presentation. So I mod modified the topic a little uh, so that I can focus on the acute presentations of uh, restless leg syndrome and neurological disorders. I have to acknowledge all the help that I have received from people that I have worked with in this area, which includes patients and their families, mentors, colleagues, everyone, both at Ball India Institute of Medical Sciences, as well as Queen's University, where I'm currently uh, working. So we start with a brief recap of, of the International Restless Leg uh, Study Group criteria for the diagnosis of restless leg syndrome. Uh, it obviously means uh, the urge to move legs or upper extremities usually but not accompanied by or felt to be caused by uncomfortable or unpleasant sensations in the legs. The other important thing is that the, this urge to move should occur in periods of rest or inactivity. It should be relieved uh, partially or totally by movement. It has a circadian predilection, so it is worse in the evening or night. And then the occurrence of these features is not solely accounted for uh, by other conditions, which are listed over here. Um, of course, there are specifiers for chronic persistent RLS um, symptoms occurring at least twice a week on average for the past one year when not treated and intermittent RLS and others. So we quickly come to the problem of restless leg syndrome in association with neurological disorders. So a few years ago, in the systematic review, Trent Walder and colleagues uh, had published a, a detailed uh, discussion on literature uh, on restless leg uh, syndrome associated with comorbidities. And they found that uh, there was a very high prevalence of restless leg uh, syndrome um, in iron def deficiency states, but also in a number of uh, neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease. However, what they found was that there was a huge variation in what people had reported and then methodology of the studies was poor. So what I have done is I've tried to just present to you the amount of uh, information which is available uh, from studies focusing on the association of restless leg syndrome and neurological disorders. And I'm not going to discuss these in detail. I'm just trying to give you an overview of how much literature is available. So in the area of stroke, if you just searched stroke and restless leg syndrome, you would find uh, 104 studies. Many of them would probably not be on this topic and 27 or one fourth are review articles. What they have uh, finally summarized is that stroke incidence is not higher in restless leg syndrome. Post-stroke patients have higher prevalence of restless leg syndrome and stroke location um, does determine RLS predilection. There are, there's a bunch of studies uh, from people with Parkinson's disease, uh, also with headache, 
few small studies in the area of peripheral neuropathy and about 100 studies in multiple sclerosis. All in all, what you would see is there is not much literature, whereas restless leg syndrome is a neurological disorder and its association with others is of huge importance to neurologists. So the focus of this particular presentation is uh, to introduce everyone to the, the acute presentation of the restless leg syndrome, update current knowledge about the spectrum of manifestation, temporal relationship, and the course of restless leg syndrome and stroke, review acute presentation of RLS in acute peripheral nervous system conditions like the Guillain-Barre syndrome, and discuss potential mechanisms. So I'll try to do this quickly because of shortage of time. So I start with a case vignette. Now, LS is a 58 years old lady admitted with a left NCA territory stroke for four days. Nurses observe the patient thrashing her left uh, leg repeatedly. Sorry, this is the right leg, worst at night. And uh, patient is responsive, but aphasic. So the ICU staff uh, believe that these are seizures and so an EEG is obtained. Uh, a number of colleagues are involved and uh, medications like gabapentin, levetiracetam, valproic acid in high doses are tried, but there's no response. Intravenous benzodiazepines are also tried, there's partial response. So here's the EEG. Now you can see that uh, anyone could classify these as uh, periodic discharges. Now, if this is going on all through the EEG, it is very difficult for uh, someone who's reading the EEG to determine whether or not this patient is uh, severely encephalopathic and or is in status epilepticus. However, when I saw this patient, she had remarkably uh, unilateral, uh, right-sided, periodic, movements involving both upper extremity as well as lower extremity. So I looked at other investigations which are available and uh, found that ferritin was 45, serum iron was very low and transparent was uh, all right. So what we did was we tried to treat her with the dopaminergic agonist that is primifixol and immediately there was more than 60% reduction in movements. After this, uh, we administered an intravenous iron infusion, and this was repeated after one week. Um, the patient's movements stopped completely, and normal sleep-wake cycles were established at two weeks uh, from the time of the diagnosis. Another patient, uh, 19 years old, female university student, presented with acute pain over both lower extremities with rapidly progressive weakness involving lower extremities followed by upper extremities over a span of two days. On examination at admission, she was normal alert. Um, she did not have any cranial nerve involvement. Power was uh, grade three at the hip joints, grade four plus at shoulder joints and had normal neck flexion. She had normal sensory exam and uh, diffuse reflexia was detected. So while in the hospital intravenous IVIG was initiated on day one with the diagnosis of uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, she kept deteriorating, developed following difficulty on day three, intubated, she was transferred to the ICU. There was no further deterioration in power. At night, she was observed to be very restless and would not sleep. She would nap for a short duration during the daytime. And then, when the nurses interacted with this patient and tried to find out what, why was she so restless, they found uh, that she was trying to say that she had some leg discomfort through responses to yes, no questions. So whenever her family would, would visit her, they would just massage her legs simply out of affection. Um, with this, she would feel better. All lights were dimmed, the noise was avoided most of the night. She was already receiving treatment with pregabalin, 150 milligrams twice a day for pain. She was also given zolpidem and intravenous lorazepam, but none of this was effective. A small dose of primipixol was started uh, when I started following this patient. And 
on the very first night she slept the entire night continued to remain free from her discomfort so nerve conduction studies conducted after a week from onset suggested uh, features of demyelinating polyneuropathy so these are the two representative cases where restless leg syndrome symptoms have started de novo just acutely uh, one in the case of a patient with a stroke and one in the case of a patient with gbs so let us review if there are other cases which have been reported so yes there are uh, as you can see here's a mm, letter to editor uh, this is in 2010 about two cases uh, of restless leg syndrome associated with the gbs then there is another one in 2016 here and then there is uh, this more recent uh, report of abrupt presentation of restless leg syndrome induced by infusion of metoclopramide during treatment of a migraine attack so it is not that it is uh, that only we were noticing uh, these Uh, restless leg uh, syndrome features to appear acutely in similar settings but there were other people so we tried to see if there was more frequent occurrence of the restless leg syndrome acutely in acute neurological conditions uh, which often goes uh, unnoticed so this was a study uh, conducted in year 2017 uh, some time before um, i uh, left for canada and this was uh, mainly uh, conducted by dr chandan who was working with us at that time so we set out to evaluate the presence and clinical characteristics of acute onset restless leg syndrome among patients with acute peripheral nervous system illness represented by gbs and patients with acute central nervous system illness represented by stroke so i'm not going into the details of uh, the methodology uh, just because of shortage of time but what we tried to do was to take these two separate groups and and then evaluate them uh, prospectively over a period of 7 uh, days and then the restless leg syndrome questionnaire would be administered at on the 7th day of admission then the other features that were noted were clinical response to dopaminergic treatment confounders were addressed by independent blinded assessment by the two of us dr chandan and myself and sleep history was obtained in detail so again we're not going into the details in the gbs group this is the demographic data and we cannot go into the details right now but it's interesting to just see um among the 40 patients who were included 10 had acute onset restless leg syndrome features and 30 did not have any so the incidence was 25% and the main associating features uh, were demyelinating pattern on nerve conduction studies which were found in seven out of the 10 people who did have acute onset rls and the more severe the illness the more were the chances of the acute presentation so let us look at the stroke group where we included 58 patients and here the only significant association was with subcortical location of uh, the stroke which was found in all 100% that is six out of 58 patients here is just a, a a picture of uh, the the location of the stroke in all the six patients and this is the snapshot of nerve conduction studies showing a demyelinating pattern in acute rls associated with the gbs so overall these were the results and we found 25% incidence in the gbs and 10.3% incidence in acute stroke significant associations as we saw was the demyelinating type in gbs and uh, subcortical location of the stroke in the stroke group now this is a, a study from 2002 by the austrian group uh, where among 161 patients who received spinal anesthesia the authors found that 8.7% patients developed for first onset or acute onset restless leg syndrome in this very special kind of situation 
just to give us a perspective of the similarities between uh, what happened in our two groups of GBS and stroke versus something that was more uh, of an induced restless leg syndrome. So the whole idea of this discussion is whether acute onset restless leg syndrome is an entity which is di distinct from the co commonly seen chronic restless leg syndrome, which is better known as the willis Egbom disease, because that uh, that way we are able to characterize the pathophysiology, the etiopathogenesis of the restless leg syndrome. So it is better to describe it as a disease, uh, which the International RLS Study Group has rightly done. Now, the main features that can be uh, found in many of the patients, especially those with CNS disorders, uh, who have a, an acute onset RLS is asymmetrical or unilateral presentation. Also, there is an absence of an identifiable iron deficiency state as we found in the two of our groups. So there was no clear uh, deficiency or low ferritin levels that we observed, no family history and variable course. In the GBS group, what we found was demyelinating uh, type was more associated with uh, the acute RLS, and it may explain the self-limiting short course. So most of these patients actually underwent remission, whereas in the stroke group, the destructive lesions in the subcortical brain locations possibly uh, are a good explanation for continued symptoms on follow-up. So quickly, a short review of the spectrum of presentation of restless leg syndrome and stroke. So here is a study which uh, Dr. Anupama Gupta had uh, initiated and uh, published, published some time uh, ago, where she actually studied a total of 346 patients uh, with stroke and assessed them prospectively uh, for both existing restless leg syndrome symptoms as well as new onset restless leg syndrome uh, after the stroke had occurred. And uh, as you can see, 61 out of these 346 patients had lower limb discomfort or sensory symptoms. Out of these 43 fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for restless leg syndrome. And among these, eight had developed de novo or post-stroke acute onset restless leg syndrome. And as you can see, all of these had subcortical location. So how does it occur? How does restless leg syndrome occur in an acute setting? There is only a hypothesis. Uh, uh, as you can see in this beautifully presented uh, diagram, the A11 projections, their interaction with spinal circuits, as you can see, and their hypothetical consequences of discomfort could possibly support involvement of restless legs, uh, involvement in acute onset restless leg syndrome more so uh, with the very mind boggling presentation in disorders associated with involvement of the peripheral nervous system, especially conditions like the GBS. So what probably happens is compromised diencephalic A11 dopaminergic inhibition to the spinal regions increases the catecholaminergic drive, uh, and this may cause acute onset restless leg syndrome features. And this kind of uh, explains uh, the, the close association either with a subcortical stroke or with uh, conditions like the GBS, which have this very uh, proximal kind of involvement of uh, the peripheral nervous system loop. So in summary, new onset restless leg syndrome features are increasingly being recognized in the setting of acute neurological conditions. In stroke or in many acute central nervous system disorders, the presentation spectrum can be diverse. However, restless leg syndrome symptoms do tend to persist, whereas in GPS, especially in the demyelinating type, restless leg syndrome is common, occurring in about 25% of the people. 
it is often incapacitating initially causing severe uh, initiation and maintenance insomnia, but is typically transient from the small group that we've been able to study. And I would say that larger prospective studies, including patients with a range of neurological conditions would aid better understanding. Thank you very much. I would be very happy to take any questions uh, if the audience has them. Uh, this may or may not occur during the live uh, session, but I will certainly try to address the questions if you can write to me. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much, Achal and the DNA team and the chairpersons. I'm going to actually just carry on uh, from something like what Dr. Garima and Dr. Achal, um, Dr. Atmaram have talked, and I will keep it uh, very simple and brief. I will not be discussing much literature review, and I think as we are running late, but I just wanted to highlight these few cases that I have seen. And I would also like to just start with this quote that, you know, what Hippocrates said and what William Osler said about medicine and our approach that it should be very holistic and look at the individual as a whole so that we do continue to provide comfort. And I think that by the end of this talk, uh, we should be all paying more attention to this. These are the two, my kind of signature slides that I do always ask, especially if they are residents in the group. Um, ask yourself that do you take a sleep history in your patient? and honestly write for yourself that is it yes or no? I mean, we don't have time to go into what is a sleep history, but at least just a few questions uh, related to sleep, let's say. And the second burning question is that should neurologists be practicing sleep medicine? And um, by the end of this talk, we will go over this question again. So like I said, I'm going to be presenting um, three cases, nothing very extraordinary, but which you may see in your day-to-day -day practice. And hopefully then we will all get sensitized on how to pick up these coexisting disorders, as we say. Um, the first one is this, I'm told that I do unusual things in my sleep. So when somebody comes forward with this statement, what could it be? Yes, it could be epileptic seizures. It could also be non-REM or REM associated disorders, some rhythmic and some psychogenic seizures. So I will present this child. She's a nine years old girl who came with the complaints of a seizure in June, 2018. Her description, the parents description was that they felt that she's looking a little strange, turned the head to one side, had shaking of one hand and was admitted and taken to the hospital. Uh, there were two EEGs done, but one did, did show some discharges and she was started on a syrup levatricetam. Uh, MRI was normal. A repeat EEG about a year later was normal and the medicines were stopped. But as expected, there was recurrence of the some events in October 2019. That means about a few months after stopping the medication. She had a staring spell and there was some vomiting and her EEG showed some discharges again. So what did she come with now? She came, this, she came actually during this lockdown period and she came with the complaints of the episodes had markedly increased. They were almost two to three times per week and sometimes more than one per night. Occurring around 12 to 1 a.m., she was sitting up, looking around scared, some vocalization, eyes were open, appeared confused. And in some of these, she could respond or they felt that she's understanding and some she couldn't. So they got really upset about these episodes. But what was another episode which was very alarming to them that she could walk to the washroom in her sleep, she could pull down her pajamas, sit on the pot, pass urine, flush, and wash her hand and she had no recollection and they followed her and she would come back to bed. So this kind of alarmed them that what is really happening. And the question arose that is this epilepsy or is it some kind of a parasomnia or an arousal disorder? So yes, she was investigated. Uh, to go briefly, there is some history of sleepwalking in the family. 
and during this period that during this lockdown the child's sleep wake pattern had markedly changed uh, she was sleeping really very late the screen time had considerably increased and she was sleeping late into the day almost to the tune of like past midnight uh, an eeg done again showed that there were definitely discharges two three events were captured these were all coming out of non rem sleep in stage 3 sleep there would suddenly be a high amplitude activity and she was this was what was noted and she was kind of sitting up so the dilemma persisted that is this uh, an epileptic event or is it a non epileptic or a sleep related event so as we can see we did see some discharges which were present but at the time that she sat up we just had some slowing and this is what was perplex, uh, perplexing to the patients and to the doctors concerned so i'll just have thrown up some uh, leading yeah. articles which when we go this through like, yeah. find that this has been there for a long time the relationship between sleep and epilepsy they were said to be unfortunate bed bed fellows and especially between parasomnias and the nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy uh so do they are they coexistent are they separate entities and there was this scale which came up which was by the the flep scale so i'm not going to go over this i think we will skip all this and go to the next case so what was it was it a frontal lobe seizures with a non rem parasomnia were they together or was it uh, all epilepsy is i think like people have said it's very hard to say and even differentiate and what is more alarming that both can coexist in the same patient so what we did advise was continue levetiracetam make it dose appropriate to her age but a strong message was given about the sleep hygiene practices uh to summarize that's what these events were and what we should do so sleep is a mystery and yes sleep and seizures becomes even more complicated so that was one abnormal behavior in sleep the second case i will go over this is a 58 years old male he was a known diabetic and a hypertensive he complained of headaches imbalance and impaired memory increased daytime sleepiness loud snoring with choking he wife also reported vocalizations during sleep and almost some words which were uttered he had very violent movements at night he was hitting out shaking and lot of distortion and movements of the facial muscles and these occurred through the night in addition over the last few months there were also some movements which were noted during the day while awake uh he's also taken premature retirement because he found out that was very difficult to carry on with his work so that was part of the memory i will just show you one brief video if we can just to give you an idea what all was happening at night and the other video i will skip so this is the night he is you see he is very restless he's folding uh, fumbling there are movements you can see his facial muscle there's lot of distortion grotesque movements and grunting sounds and snoring and things were happening so i'll go ahead and so analysis of the history meant that there were some abnormal movements he did have some coriform movements which i had another video there was impaired memory ataxia snoring with choking so what i will skip this he was uh, mmsc was 24 by 30 uh, oxygen saturations were low and like i said he had the semi purposive involuntary movements of the fingers and the toes and plantar's were flexor gait was wide based and he had impaired tandem walking so what was the possibilities uh, or what what the examinations done so far he had had as you can see 1 2 3 4 4 times some sleep studies were done and each time all that was mentioned was there is sleep apnea and some leg movement and he was give, advised a cpap and a, a pramipexol but the problems persisted so when we saw him i thought that we should get a complete work up of all the uh, antibodies which were negative uh, psg revealed that there was lots of movements grunting very poor sleep efficiency severe obstructive sleep apnea which was only controlled with a very high level bilevel device and he had a non rem and a rem parasomnia so a diagnostic test was performed uh, putting all this together 
and that was the Eglon 5 antibody, which turned out to be positive. So he was a case who had non-REM REM parasomnia, he had obstructive sleep apnea, he had a memory problem, he had ataxia, and the antibody was positive. Uh, modes of treatment were discussed with the family regarding the IVIG and the immunosuppression. They were not willing. They did change the PAP device. And we did publish this case as the first case report from India. And um, so I'm going to skip the Eglon 5 uh, discussion. Uh, clinical manifestations, uh, which people can check, they are available. And Dr. Uh, Kalash Bhatia, there's a group from Spain, there's a group from Bridget Hovel, they've all done a lot of work. But I think for us neurologists, if you see bulbar symptoms, gait instability, cognitive impairment, and some sleep issues, please think of this Eglon 5 disease together. Uh, last case I will talk, which I have just seen actually two days before, and I wanted to add this uh, to the list for the neurologists because um, another very important thing that we, if we do miss this. And so this was a known uh, diabetic hypertensive with very poor control of both, had some fall in 2019, don't know what, but his recent problems were memory impairment, He's become very slow, takes about an hour to do his routine activities and an impaired balance. And on direct questioning, there was a lot of snoring, though he's sleeping alone, but his son has recently joined him and he's very sleepy in the day. MMSC 26, mild rigidity and mild decreased arm swing on one side, otherwise nothing really alarming in the neurological examination. He'd had uh, some changes which were predominantly seen in the frontal and parietal and occipital areas. So what did we do? Um, keeping in mind the relationship between memory, cognition, snoring, etc. I said, okay, let's at least just try and look for a level three study, which is what is called as a screening study. And to our, I mean, to our expectation, what we did think, there was severe sleep apnea. He had desaturations to the tune of almost 20 to 30%. And if I see you, show you the overnight graph, the First line is the oxygen desaturation. The second line is the number of apneas. So it was a very, very case of a severe obstructive sleep apnea. And the index came out to be 58 times an hour was the number of apneas that he had. So I think the logical question, which we all can answer together is what should be done now? Should we just continue to give him some anticholinergics or the mementines, et cetera, or should we intervene with a PAP device, which will improve oxygenation, improve his memory, and hopefully have a lot of bearing on his cognition. So the, there are numerous articles about sleep and cognition. Uh, are, do they, is it a precursor or is it an accelerator? It's still, still being like, is it a chicken and the egg story which goes on? But whatever the story or whatever the link, I think it's important to detect it and to treat it. And hopefully we can arrest this further neurodegeneration. Uh, the role of the G lymphatic system, which kind of removes everything at night or the garbage or the junk accumulated. So it prevents degenerative changes happening is what is of great importance. So I, the shortage of time, I'm not going to talk about the pathogenesis. And I, like I said, we will just um, stick to the cases. In fact, um, the last entity is of course stroke. Just to share with you that 50% prevalence of sleep disorders, but only about 2% get a sleep study. So just keep it in mind. Why is this there? Is this the access to testing? Is it lack of awareness? And why are we not able to follow these people up? Uh, so the final question, uh, should we take a sleep-wake history in patients with neurological disorders? I think we should. Um, that's been my journey from neurology to sleep medicine. And I do hope many more can join me along in this way. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Manveer. I think uh, we are well within time in this session. And I would uh, request uh, Dr. Achal to proceed to the next session.